Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us for our weekly conversation today. My name is Matt Fulton and I'm the Vice President of National Engagement at POCO. We've got an excellent panel to share their perspectives on maintaining a sense of community in a socially distanced world this morning. Uh, we're going to be talking about the challenges that community leaders are facing in engagement um, in connecting with their residents um, and just what are the creative ways that they're using to continue to engage and build effective engagement with their residents and stakeholders in their community, especially during these very challenging times. The intent of these sessions is really pretty straightforward. We want to gather perspectives from recognized government leaders and share them with other people who are faced by the same challenges. And the idea is simply by benefiting from their perspectives, you might be able to advance your community through a new idea, a new strategy, a new, new, new concept, a new, new solution. Uh, so thank you for being here and, um, and joining us. Um, here's the format for how we're going to be handling today's discussion. Uh, we'll take a few minutes to introduce the panelists and allow them to briefly introduce themselves and then talk a little bit about their backgrounds. Um, and then I'll kick off the conversation asking questions that draw out their perspectives on these topics and um, just for the benefit of learning how they're connecting with the residents and maintaining that overall sense of community that I know we all appreciate as being a really important thing in, uh, in all of our communities. And then during the second half, we'll provide an opportunity to have a little dialogue between each other, and then we'll just finish up with, uh, with a few final comments. So if that sounds fine, why don't, we, uh, why don't we get underway? Let me introduce our panelists. Uh, because local government is a, an international global thing, I'm really happy to introduce and bring in international voices. Um, and I'm happy to introduce Michael Genova, who is the Director of Corporate and Strategic Communications with the City of Vaughan, which is in Toronto, uh, uh, about an hour north of New York, I learned. Um, Michael has over 10 years of communications and intergovernmental relations and public policy experience, uh, but he's also experienced working as a political advisor before he joined Municipal Public Service. Um, Michael's got a political science degree from the University of Toronto, and he holds two master's, master's degrees uh, one of the master's degrees is in elections and campaign management from Fordham University in New York, and he has a master's in public administration from Western University. Uh, Michael's a 2019 recipient of the Canadian Association of Municipal Administrators, uh, better known as CAMA, uh, scholarship program. CAMA is actually um, a, a co comparable to ICMA. Um, Michael, thank you for joining us, and I would love it if you would just share a little bit more about yourself. No, Matt, I just wanted to say thank you for having me, and I'm delighted to be with Susan and Serena as well uh, today. So I am uh, Director of Corporate and Strategic Communications with the City of Vaughan. It's a municipality uh, just north of Toronto, and it's got a population of over 335,000 individuals. In my role as Director, we've got three principal business units, uh, communications, of course, intergovernmental relations, and stakeholder and community engagement. So I am delighted to be here uh, for this discussion to talk about how communications helps drive engagement and how engagement helps inform uh, our communications efforts. That's super, thank you, Michael. Um, and I hope you're having a, having a good winter this year. Um, Absolutely. I wanna introduce our second panelist, Susan Thorpe, uh, was appointed as County Administrator in Yuma County in 2016. Susan has over 30 years of local government experience, including some leadership roles that she has played in Texas, California, and Arizona. So, uh, she's very active with the Women Leading Government Organization, which is well known nationally, um, as well as being involved in California. Uh, you know, Susan is a recognized leader in our profession. She was honored as uh, MPA Alumni of the Year by the University of North Texas for her contribution to local government, and she's received an outstanding uh, City County Manager Award from the Arizona City County Management Association. Um, she, one of the interesting things about Susan that I learned is that she's a contributing author um, <coughs> uh, for a book called The Democracy at the Doorstep uh, by Michael Condiff and Melissa Byrne Bosmer. Uh, we probably all recognize Michael Condiff's name um, and the work that he's done. So Susan, that was really fun to learn about that. Uh, she received her both her bachelor's degree and her master's degree from the University of Northern Texas. And uh, she's also 
uh, very impressively, a uh, graduate of the Harvard's John F. Kennedy School Program for Senior Executives in state and local government. Um, one of the other nice impressive things about Susan is being active in ICMA and being a credential manager now for almost two decades. Uh, Susan, thank you for joining us and would love it if you would share just a little bit more about yourself. Sure, uh, thanks Matt. So um, I think one of the interesting things from my experience and it helps my perspective is that I've been a city manager for many, many years and now it's my first time as a county manager and just learning about the differences between cities and counties. I learn something new every day at the county, at Yuma County, um, and it helps me appreciate city's perspectives. And then I can also insert kind of my now, if not five years of knowledge of county management uh, with my colleagues around our county. We have four other cities within Yuma County, as well as across the state. So I'm also active in the Arizona City County Management Association, and I really get a lot out of that. We have a very close knit um, organization. We only have 15 counties and 91 cities in Arizona. And so we are able to get to know one another and to connect with one another and share and help each other. So glad to glad to be here in Arizona. Yeah, well, thank you. And uh, just the fact that you're sharing with your colleagues is kind of uh, validating what we're trying to do here in, in sharing your perspectives on this topic. So really appreciate you joining us, Susan. Uh, our third candidate, our third candidate, I'm sorry, our third panelist <laughs> is Serena, Serena Red Black, um, who's the assistant city manager in the city of Culver City, California. Serena has 20 years of experience in public sector management. Uh, one of the things that was really impressive as I was looking at her background or learning about her background is just the breadth of responsibilities that she has in her position. She's got really specific skills in all aspects of human resource, risk management, cultural affairs, and uh, city clerk operations, um, which as we all appreciate is a, a very important responsibility. Serena got her bachelor's degree from the University of Phoenix in business management and has a master's degree in public administration from California State University in Long Beach. Uh, she's also a senior certified professional with the Society of Human Resources. Uh, Serena, thank you for being on the panel today and would welcome you to share just a little bit more about yourself. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm really happy to be a part of this panel. It's very impressive. I have my pen and I can't wait to learn from the other panelists that are here today. So um, as Matt mentioned, I'm from Culver City, California, which is in Los Angeles County uh, on the west side of Los Angeles. And it is a very robust and engaged community of 40,000 people. Sometimes that 40,000 feels like 140,000. Um, it's, as I mentioned, a very engaged community and our communication strategy is pretty robust, but I'm so willing and interested to learn of what we can be doing better. And of course, share what we're doing. So thank you for having me here today. That's great. Um, thank you for being here. And thanks to all of you for being here. Uh, so, so let's get into the, into the, uh, the topic at hand. Um, the topic today is maintaining a sense of community in a socially distanced world. You know, over the course of the last year, COVID-19 has just simply totally disrupted any sense of normalcy in our communities. And then you add on to that some of the civil unrest activities and just all of the changes that we've had to adapt to um, organizationally and uh, operationally, uh, service delivery, uh, it's just simply upset and dis it disrupted everybody's life. Uh, and given this unsettled environment, it's just more important than ever to maintain a meaningful connection with community stakeholders. Uh, we need to make sure that we understand what their current needs or priorities are because they may be totally different than they were pre-COVID. Um, and just as importantly, residents need to feel uh, like they're being heard and that they do feel like they're part of the community. This two-way authentic connection that is such an important part in anybody's life is, uh, is a really important focus that communities need to have, but it's really, really challenging. Uh, the pandemic presents a lot of challenges in maintaining this sense of community. And so what we wanna do today is really hear about how you're dealing with that and some of the creative solutions that you're bringing to the table. One way to start the conversation is maybe to take a look at the problem. Um, you know, one of the, during, through our research, we have learned that 80% of U.S. adults have never even been to a city council meeting. Um, engagement has always been difficult, um, even before we had these additional challenges. Uh, there are just simply barriers that get in front of our opportunity to get people 
fully engaged in uh, topics. Lives are busy. Uh, meetings are at off hours when people can't make it. Um, the traditional public engagement practices just creates barriers and challenges for folks that uh, makes it difficult for people to get involved. Um, it's not unusual, but really frustrating for staff that local projects don't really get people involved. And so projects uh, don't get the benefit of that in input and information to make all of those local projects more, uh, more important and better projects overall. <clears throat> And now you add on a pandemic to all of these uh, issues um, and there are even more factors and challenges to overcome. You know, people are having to adapt to a new world. They're homeschooling their kids while they're trying to maintain their job in a virtual environment. Cities organizationally have been meeting virtually. And uh, so you've had to shift your whole operations on how you deliver services and how you connect. Um, we have this environment of just political uh, uh, polarity that has caused a lot of issues relating to civility in our community, civility in meetings. Uh, there's all sorts of things that have been created. Um, but we do understand the value and the importance of the fact that people need to feel connected to the community and the challenge is how do you do it? How do you listen better so that people's voices are being heard and their engagement is deemed uh, valuable? Um, so here are the three questions we're gonna explore. Uh, the first one is, how has your communications and engagement strategy evolved since the beginning of the pandemic? The second one is, how does the engagement influence your success in maintaining a sense of community? And then finally, which tools are you currently using to measure feedback from a resident's perspective during these challenging times? So with that, let me just uh, stop screen sharing and uh, get into the question. Um, and Michael, I'd like to start with you, if you wouldn't mind. Yep. Um, how has Vaughn's communication and engagement strategy evolved since the start of the pandemic? So I think the way I would uh, outline uh, our response as a result of COVID-19 is there's three guiding principles that influence what we've done and how we continue to navigate through this. The first is to remember that public information is a public service. And especially in a declared state of emergency, the need for effective, accurate, real-time information is fundamental. And what I'd like to say is um, you only get one shot at safe drinking water when you turn the taps on. And I believe the same principle applies to when you're messaging to the public. The second piece I would highlight is that process is our friend. And you need to work with the appropriate internal and external stakeholders. You have to have the, the appropriate communications processes in place to get the approvals so that you can get the accurate and timely messaging out the door uh, to, your, to your targeted audiences. And then the third thing I like to identify is, again, when you're in a declared state of emergency, but also more broadly for the mandate of the public sector, when you have an approved key message, you can do anything. And that's uh, what I really believe is when communications becomes both an art and a science. You want to be able to uh, uh, look at different tactics. All tactics, I think, should be considered uh, on the table to, to reach as many people as possible uh, because... Uh, Public information, again, is this important public service that helps inform the policy decision-making process uh, for members of council, and especially uh, uh, when you're dealing with a council manager uh, system. So that's really been uh, something that has flowed from, uh, from COVID-19, really reinforcing those principles. Michael, as you kind of have thought about the evolution of uh, your communication strategy, has Vaughn embraced kind of a organizational model as opposed to coming out of your department or uh, is it, uh, talk a little bit about how the organization has embraced to become part of the processes that you've set up and, and some of the important aspects of it. Yeah, I, absolutely. So really what we have is a centralized model to communications. We have different communications advisors who support different departments. So there's always two-way communication happening. Um, the expectation is our advisors are proactively engaging public works, transportation, uh, fire and rescue services about what they're doing and that our partner departments understand that they can come to us at any time to identify um, 
uh, communications opportunities as well. We have taken a centralized approach versus a decentralized approach because uh, what we want to ensure is that the messaging is accurate, it's consistent, but also it helps eliminate silos because someone in the recreation services department may be working on an initiative that helps also tell a good news story about what the IT department or what the libraries are doing and how can we pull that together to tell a bigger narrative. That's very good. I mean, I, I love the notion of the improved team message, which organizationally then provides for that two-way interaction, but you've got that consistent message going out to the community. So uh, people can have confidence and trust in the message that they're hearing. Is that a fair way to summarize oh, it? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Susan, could you share how your communication and engagement strategy has evolved in Yuma County since the beginning of the pandemic and just really over the last year or so? Sure, um, you know, counties are pretty much out of sight, out of mind for most people. They think of their city first, unless they actually live in an unincorporated area of the county. Uh, but with the health department being a county function and it serves the entire population, that's the way Arizona is set up. The county health departments serve the entire area through a health district throughout each county. That really pushed us to the forefront in everybody's mind. We, we normally are something that kind of is secondary. So county government has stepped up to make sure that we keep people informed, um, not only with the, the news media, with our public TV channel, video, video web streaming, social media, and um, other types, of, you know, the standard types of, of uh, exposure to information. We found that older people have a more difficult time getting information through the, the uh, social media means. And so we have to go pretty old school with those individuals. Um, they often will rely on the library for getting their information and having up that as kind of a community center. So we push out information through the library to a lot of people as well, which is a little unusual. Um, we do have a daily update at 3 p.m. each day to everyone regarding uh, COVID, any COVID-related information, whether it's testing locations, vaccine, what the updates are, uh, where it's available, the sites to go um, to try to register, um, our, our case numbers, our death numbers, everything is happens at 3 p.m. every day so that it, people can rely on that information to get the very latest that's available from the public health department. Susan, who gives that message daily? That is a, co a collaboration between county administration, our communications team, which is one person, and uh, our health department. Our, the epidemiological folks give us the data. The hospital also provides their data. We only have one medical center in uh, Yuma County. It's very large but uh, they provide the hospitalization and ICU bed information and then we compile all that into one 3 p.m. update um, that we push out. That is really outstanding. Uh, that's great to hear. And you know, your comment about counties being out of sight, out of mind. Um, uh, during this past year, counties have really taken the forefront just given the responsibilities that you have. And so it's been great to see the counties step up. Our research has actually shown that during COVID, Trust and, um, trust and respect for local government and includes both cities and counties has actually gone up. And I think it's because of those kind of actions that Yuma County is doing for helping just to reinforce the importance of transparency, accountability, that two-way communication piece. Um, and um, <clears throat> have you gotten good responses from that uh, daily report from your residents? Actually, yes, I get um, information, I get emails from people asking about more, as that say, I read your information in the update, but here's another question I'd like to have answered. And those oh. kinds of things we incorporate in the next, in updates going forward. So we're constantly refining the message to make sure we're including everything that people really want and need to know. The other thing that Yuma well, County has is um, what's called a chat feature on our website. So people can, can don't even have to go look for something on our website. They can enter a chat. And we have um, staff members <clears> that are monitoring it all the time. Maybe they say, hey, where do I go get a test? And then they'll, forward, they'll uh, answer the chat with the, uh, the attachment of where they can go get uh, tested, those kinds of things. Um, it's just a real instant way to immediately respond to people's requests online. 
Yeah, what a great feature to have on your website. That's got to be very helpful for you. Thank you. Serena, how has Culver City's communication and engagement strategy evolved over the course of the last year? Yeah, sure. So as I mentioned, it, Culver City is a very engaged community. So even prior to COVID, um, we had a pretty robust communications um, infrastructure. So I think what we did was some of the standard things that uh, both Michael and uh, Susan have mentioned, such as you know getting out messaging through Gov Delivery, through the city's webpage, um, using Nixle, um, Nextdoor, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. <laughs> we are very, very engaged with all the various different social platforms. And then of course, all the old school press releases and newspaper articles. I think how things have engaged since the pandemic is um, sort of touching a little bit on what Michael said, getting the right people in the right roles. So our emergency operations center immediately um, activated. We had a communication team that was put together and this communication team was comprised or is comprised. We're still very active one year into this, um, but it's comprised of individuals from each of the different city departments. And, and I didn't mention, but Culver City is a full service city. So even though we only have 40,000 residents, um, we have our own police department, our own fire department. We have a municipal bus line. We have a transfer station for solid waste and recycling. So it's a very, very active and busy city. Um, and we also have a really active senior uh, center um, with, and there's about 500 plus, I think, members across LA County. And so when the pandemic hit, obviously that senior center was closed. So we had a number of, um, of our senior citizens that were feeling very disengaged um, from the community. So what we did, in addition to all the other messaging that I, I mentioned, we also started putting out, um, uh, we put out a 24 seven hotline. And so, Individuals could call that hotline to get COVID related information. They could call that hotline if they just needed someone to talk to because they were isolated. Um, and we got really good feedback on that. Another thing that we did was because we are a small community, we were able to put together gift bags and packaging and along with the meal delivery service to actually go out to some of our uh, members that are homebound just to give them that sense of engagement so they weren't so isolated. And then I think finally, the other thing that has evolved quite a bit with our communication strategy is ensuring that a lot of the messaging is put out uh, or translated in Spanish. Um, we have a number of Spanish speaking uh, community members, so they have found that that to be really helpful. And then another thing that we've done that Susan also mentioned was just putting that same messaging out every day at the same time. And we do that through the Gov delivery system and it's a standard messaging about what the city is doing, what the pandemic numbers are, different resources that are available. Um, and we put that also on the city's webpage. We've created a simple URL so that individuals can remember exactly where to go to to get that information. Yeah, that's really something. Um, have you noticed, I mean, I, I suspect in California, your numbers are still such that you're meeting, you're continuing to meet virtually. Um, yeah. Have you noticed, yeah. uh, what, what's been the impact on the number of people who engage in those virtual environments? Have you noticed any increase or decrease or change in the number of people that are engaging in some of the more formal meetings that you're holding? Absolutely. Um, I think we started meeting maybe about two weeks after the pandemic. We were able to put things in place rather quickly and we hold all of our meetings via WebEx. And I will say for Culver City, we've actually noticed more participation um, for members of the public. And that might be because it's simpler for some people to actually, you know, go online and attend a virtual meeting. And if they don't have the technology available to attend the meeting virtually, they can call into the meeting and um, participate that way as well. And of course, it, it's still on cable television. But I would say definitely our numbers have increased since COVID. Yeah, one of the things that I'm picking up from your comments is kind of your attention to those people-to-people uh, -people needs, the home, working directly and intimately with the homebound, that 24-7 kind of a hotline, I'm sure is a really helpful tool that your community is benefiting from. So uh, congratulations on all that. That just sounds like just outstanding things that you're doing to communicate. Thank you. Uh, let's, let's switch on to the second question. 
And Susan, I'd like to start with you with this one. Susan, how do you think engagement influences how successful Yuma County is in maintaining its sense of community? We have learned that people really want information and they want it to be reliable and they will tell you when they don't like what you're telling them or if something's not good enough, especially our elderly population. <laughs> they're telling us what meets their needs and what doesn't meet their needs and, they're, and they do give us suggestions, which we listen to. So one thing I'm very proud about in Yuma County is that we have over the last four years or more have really broken down silos. People work very closely together and very easily together to make sure to help one another get the job done, to do whatever it takes to assist someone else in, work in, um, in providing services to the public. So some examples are, well, this is probably not on your topic, but um, the engagement with the public when we have had our clinics at the health department, our IT people are right there. Uh, they actually created a Wi-Fi network out in the parking lot so that people that our nurses could have tablets that were able to record the individuals who are coming through to get a shot, uh, do all of their information and submit it online so that the elderly are, um, clients or um, citizens did not have to do that. They were finding our elderly, which were our, our prioritized 1B populations, we're having a really hard time trying to use the state's portal. It was very unuser friendly, no matter what age you are. And then they were just completely uh, having difficulty. So we did it on site with them. They gave us the information. Our, our nurses put the information in tablets. And because we had that Wi-Fi network provided by IT, which actually was supported by the, our, our emergency management folks, they were able to make that easy, simple, fast. And everybody was so appreciative about how seamless it worked for them and how they got the really top-notch service. That's really, that's really cool. I'm glad you brought that up. You know, mm -hmm. I was a city manager for 30 years and you, you've got a, had a long career in city management. Um, and uh, I think everybody on the panel today would agree that when you get into these kind of situations, city employees across all departments will step up to the game. And uh, I'd love to hear you talk about the collaboration that you're finding organizationally and just making sure that the services are being delivered, even if it's outside the normal uh, lines of operation, just to make sure that the job is getting done in a way that's going to meet the citizens' need. And it sounds like, and tell me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like that's exactly what's going on in Yuma County. Uh, right. And I also forgot to mention that we had not only Public Works helping with um, cones and setting up uh, organization that way through the parking lot, but also volunteers that came in and helped. Uh, the nursing students at our uh, Northern Arizona University came through and were helping oh. to do the vaccinations as well. Yeah, so some community collaboration, which is even, even better. That's great. Serena, how does engagement play into your success in maintaining a sense of community in Culver City? I think resident engagement is extremely important because it allows both the organization and, and um, individual employees to collectively come up with decisions and, and design resolutions to different issues um, outside of a silo. It, it helps us get more buy-in. Um, one thing that Culver City has been dealing with for the past six plus months is looking at reimagining our public safety services. And, and as you can imagine, that's been a topic that has been um, a hot button. <laughs> there, there are people on, on both sides or all sides of the issue. And during this time, the, the community has been very engaged in providing staff with, with their input and what their thoughts are on how they want their community to be policed and what type of resources that they want um, to be allocated for those services. And it's been helpful to have the residents and the community so engaged because now as we're looking at potential options on how we can reimagine our public safety services, we are getting firsthand information back from the community on, on developing what the, that program might look like. So for us, it's been extremely helpful so that we're not going down the wrong road, so to speak. Yeah, and have you found those, um, those uh, activities around your police uh, discussions? Um, have you been getting good feedback from the residents just about the fact that you're engaging and the impact that it's having with residents' connection to the community? 
Yeah, I think, you know, once we're able to get the emotions out of it, there has been a level of appreciation for the level of engagement. We have gone as far as doing community surveys, focus group meetings. We've engaged a number of different um, community organizations. We have engaged a number of our commissions. Um, I cannot tell you how many meetings, <laughs> community meetings I've had over the last six months to talk about this. So this room has become my, my home and my prison. <laughs> <laughs> I think everybody can appreciate that fact. Yeah. Um, well, congratulations on that work. That's really important work that you're doing. Michael, how has engagement influenced Bond's success in maintaining its sense of community? Uh, so what I would say is in, in local government, it's so important to remember that the decision-making process is rooted in democracy. And what we want to do, um, all staff across the board in all departments want to do everything we can to ensure that the public is informed and they're engaged in that their feedback is captured uh, in the form of staff reports that will help inform the decision-making process uh, made by members of council. Because uh, ultimately our counselors recognize that they are accountable to, uh, to their constituents and, and engagement is just fundamental to getting uh, that public support to ensure that the public policy process can move forward uh, in an account open, accountable and transparent manner and, and with confidence as well. Michael, are you meeting virtually? Are your, your councils meeting virtually? Or are you yep. in person? So, our, our councils are meeting virtually, our committee meetings are meeting virtually, our task forces are meeting virtually. All of our public information sessions are being done uh, virtually as well. It's been, it's been an incredible success. Um, we, we pivoted towards virtual meetings very quickly into the declared state of emergency. The city of Vaughan was the first city in Ontario to declare a state of emergency. And uh, you know we've been really uh, resourceful throughout uh, with the council meetings in in across the board uh, in the corporation with all of our service offerings. And have you noticed a shift in uh, the numbers of people that engage operating virtually uh, as compared to before? Yeah, I, I mean, I would say it's either been steady or it's increased. And, uh, you know, it always depends on what is the top of mind issue that we're seeking engagement on. Um, of course, something that might be uh, a little bit more top of mind will, will draw uh, greater participation rates. But we've, we've had to deal with a number, a number of issues and we've been able to, you know, it's great to be able to accommodate the public uh, from the comfort and the safety of their, of their homes uh, so that they can certainly have their voices heard versus having to come out to a community center or to come out to, to city hall. So um, uh, in that respect, there is a, there is a silver lining uh, amidst everything that we've been through uh, to, to be able to further reach out to people so that their voices are heard. And so that city building can continue. That's great, thank you. Um, let's move on to the third question. Um, and Matt, Serena, Matt, one thing, yeah, one thing I was just going to mention um, and, and, and something Michael said, triggered it for me is one thing that we are talking about in our city. And I'm curious to know if Michael and, and Susan are having these same conversations, but because the virtual meetings have been such a, a success, we are looking at um, how when things ever finally open back up uh, post pandemic, we're looking at holding hybrid meetings where uh, simultaneously we'll have on-site meetings as well as virtual meetings. So I'm just kind of curious if those discussions are being had in, in Vaughan or in Yuma County as well. Uh, I'll let Susan go first and then I'll, I'll follow up. So uh, we are probably the exception uh, instead of the rule. Our board of supervisors is five individuals and they do not want to meet virtually. Are they are meeting in person? They're spread out. It's a it's a fairly small board of supervisors auditorium, and so we have about twelve seats that are spaced out, um, allowed for the public. We have a we have a public comment email address that people can send in their comments if they don't want to be 
you know, come to an in-person meeting uh, in order for them to, to make comments under public comment, uh, at, as well as any agenda item. Uh, but our board just really wants that face-to-face -face conversation. And mm -hmm. our, our we, we are in an old bank building. And when the um, supervisor's auditorium was first set up, which is very small and very outdated, it's got a feed for the um, TV channel, but it does not really, we haven't figured out how to do a Zoom meeting or how to do a combination meeting. So that's one of the things that my deputy and my communications director are trying to figure out. How can we do a combined meeting so that we can have the public more engaged and they don't feel like they just can only comment through an email address or by coming in person. So we're really behind the curve on that. So I'd love to hear um, what other people are doing in that regard. Yeah, so just building off what Serena uh, raised, uh, very good point. Uh, big picture, we are making sense of the new normal across the board with, with all of our service offerings. And uh, the idea of offering that hybrid model is definitely something that is that continues to be part of the conversation. Um, because when we think over and above the declared state of emergency and, and whether it's a stay home directive, uh, when you think about the opportunity uh, to, um, uh, to, to provide engagement uh, opportunities virtually, whether it's a council meeting or whether it's a specific uh, in focus group session, for example, on a new development, uh, it helps to empower people uh, who may have accessibility challenges uh, or, or, any, or any other uh, conflicting challenges, to, again, to come out to a community center, to come out to, to City Hall. So uh, uh, again, these have gone really well at the City of Vaughan. We use uh, Teams and uh, among among other tools, and uh, a lot of a lot of positive feedback along the way. Thank you, Serena. Thank you for asking that question. That was going to be one of my follow up questions uh, at the end. I'm glad you brought it up, and uh, uh, I think that it's going to be interesting to see the overall shifts that are going to be happening. Go ahead, Susan. So I wanted to add that we do, our staff meetings are all virtual. We do have a number of staff individuals who are working from home and are having virtual meetings. Those are going very, very well. And we have a lot of regional type uh, organizations and those meetings are all virtual and it really works well. We just haven't figured out the, the combo of the virtual yeah. plus mm -hmm. in-person yet. Yeah, got it. Thank you. Serena, can you talk about the tools that Culver City is using to help measure feedback from residents uh, and businesses um, to get their perspectives on the services that you're delivering? Yeah, sure. I would say that the biggest tool that we are utilizing currently is the engagement of a communications consultant. Um, I mentioned that all of our communications, excuse me for a moment, I mentioned that all of our communications um, have been centralized through the EOC and even prior to the EOC, uh, we would have quarterly meetings with each department to talk about you know, what is going on, what's coming up on the calendar, just to ensure that our communications were centralized. But since post pandemic, we've uh, kicked it up a notch to also review the content and how many you know, hits we're getting on certain social media platforms, how many views um, are being received. And our communication consultants are really, really helping us to be engaged with the community. So responding back to those posts on Nextdoor and on Facebook to ensure that the messaging that's getting out is consistent and the information that the community and business leaders are looking for, that they're able to access it pretty quickly. Is that, uh, talk a little bit more of uh, the way you're incorporating data into decision-making um, in the things that you're doing, the data uh, that you're getting through the uh, social media platforms. Right. So we are taking that data from, from the um, social media feedback and we're looking at what is it that the community is talking about? What is it that's important to the community? And then how do we shape that into an agenda item? Meaning that the city council may have already given direction regarding some of their goals and objectives. And then we may hear some um chatter going on on social media that might help us include other information in that same agenda item so that we are providing the information to the full community um, about what 
what is deemed to be important to them. And then I think we're also looking at some of that feedback as far as being proactive and in, in addressing issues that we did not know was an issue in, until we read it or heard about it through social media. Yeah, that's very helpful. And, and uh, I suspect that that data helps to inform a lot of decisions. Uh, so thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that. Michael, what, what tools are you using in Vaughn to help you measure feedback for residents uh, over the past year or just during these challenging times? Yeah, I, I would say all options are on the table when it comes to our engagement tactics, quantitative, qualitative. Um, so feedback we receive through our social media accounts, feedback that we receive through the Access Vaughn call center that we've got that residents can call, sort of your one-stop shop if you're looking for questions or comments. Feedback that we get shared to us from members of council. Again, it's both uh, a blend of qualitative and, and quantitative. Um, and uh, those tactics really depend on the types of projects we're, we're working on. So for example, we there's a lot of consultation that happens with the planning department and the planning department will bring on uh, consultants to help uh, on a particular project. And my team will take part as well to help uh, identify, again, what are those tactics that should be used? How should those questions be framed uh, so that we can solicit the feedback? So ultimately, it comes back in the form of a staff report that can be shared online or members of council can then speak to it at a committee meeting or at a council meeting. And that members of the public can also see that report as well in advance so they can take part in those council and committee meetings uh, as well. And again, because the engagement business unit lives within the communications department, we really try to hardwire those two. Uh, we do pour over the results of that information to help inform the communications that we do, both external facing and internal facing, in addition to how it informs uh, the staff reports as well. Yeah, that's it. Does Lauren have an established strategic plan with, uh, sounds like you have some performance metrics in place both quantitative and qualitative measures for you to track your progress. Is that, uh, can you add a little bit to that? Yeah, absolutely. So we do, we do have a council approved strategic plan. Um, the strategic plan usually is, is uh, launched at the beginning of each council term. We have four year council terms, identifies number of core priorities. We have a, a department called transformation and strategy, which helps, uh, helps govern the strategic plan and monitor its successes. Uh, we use uh, OKRs, objectives, key results. Again, uh, this is all about ensuring uh, accountability and that staff go back and deliver on those council approved priorities and those council approved priorities in order to get them off the ground. We need public information. We need to communicate, we need to engage and we need to look at different tactics uh, that will allow us to reach different audiences uh, within within the community. I mean, social media matters a lot and we know curb signs matter a lot. We know direct mailers matter a lot because what we do also is every two years, we have something called a citizen satisfaction survey. So it's a citywide survey, telephone survey. Um, and we ask on a, an array of different issues. And of course, communications and engagement has a few dedicated Questions And what we hear from the public is that they want more of everything in the form of communications <laughs> engagement. And, uh, and, and again, to in Vaughan, we're very fortunate because our mayor, our council takes communications and engagement uh, very seriously as well. And so they really do help drive the process in that regard. It really sounds like you've got an established approach for uh, moving the community forward. Um, and incorporating the engagement. And um, uh, congratulations on that. That's a, it sounds like it's a very positive effort in your Thank community. You. And, and it's very top of mind for our council, but it's equally top of mind for all the departments as well. So there's really great buy-in. Yeah, that's great. And the, and the public, uh, public has an opportunity to see the progress that you're making on your strategic goals. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's not only is it something that we, re we report on formally in, um, uh, to council each year, uh, in through staff reports, but it's it it's it's a living document. Your strategic plan is a living document, and it really is a good news story too. And so, for the communications department, we're look we're looking to do at least one 
uh, type of council. We call them council communications packages where every day our council will see a news release go out. They get dedicated social media content, custom creative as well. And so we're always looking for a good news story every day to help share and also to ensure that the public remains informed about what's going on. And, uh, and uh, so, so certainly we pull it all together. It is a really great team effort. Yeah, that's great. That sounds just super. Thank you. Susan, what tools are you using for measuring resident feedback during uh, the past year in Yuma County? That's a good question. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to look into Vaughn's information uh, because it sounds like they've really taken the strategic plan to the next level. We created a strategic mm -hmm. plan two years ago, and it's still evolving. I'm still trying to tie it together, not only with the budget, but with every uh, director's operations, and then translate that into in each employee's jobs. Um, we are in the also in the process of developing a communication plan because we realized during this process that we were being reactive and trying to be nimble and, and responding to the needs as they arose, but we really didn't have a strategy, a framework that would guide what we were doing. And so we're creating a communications plan uh, that does have both external and internal components and we'll be creating metrics because we don't really have any metrics right now. We're, we're um, lacking in a lot of robust performance measurements, I say, as Yuma County. And we need to get further along in that process. And I think communications, the communications plan and creating metrics would be a, a good step in the right, in that direction. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, thank you for all those perspectives. There's a lot of great stuff that you shared today. Um, I would be interested in uh, seeing if any of you have questions for each other. Um, you've already established some dialogue between each other, so I'd welcome if there's any other questions. Uh, now would be the time to jump into that. I would be interested, uh, well, go ahead, Susan. So I'm really curious about the, the senior center and creating the 24 seven hotline. How did you staff that? Was that something you engaged someone external to or did you staff that with your internal employees? How did that work? Yeah, we actually staffed it internally. So when the pandemic hit, uh, there were a lot of positions that um, did not have work hours because of programs being closed such as in our recreation uh, facilities or, you know, work sites were, were closed. So what we did was we took those employees and we reassigned them to the hotline so that they could still continue to uh, have work hours and obviously continue getting a paycheck through the pandemic. So that, that's essentially how we staffed it. And we made sure that we created all the documents that they needed to be able to respond to various questions because some of the questions were pretty routine questions that we could anticipate. And if there were questions that came in that we could not anticipate, what we would advise that staff member to do was just to take down the information and then someone else would give that person a call back either the following day, just depending on what time the call came, came in. I'd like to ask uh, all of you just for a quick response. Um, it's always kind of neat to find out, you, you know, you're in the midst of all of these issues, uh, but as you kind of look at your communities and your organization, if I were to ask you, what's the, sickest, the single biggest challenge facing your organization right now, uh, how would you respond to that? And uh, go ahead, Susan, let's start with you. That's a good question. Um, well, our single, non-COVID related uh, challenge is the legislature. <laughs> the state legislature is in session and the counties are, and cities both, are at risk of being, <clears throat> of authorities being taken away or mandates being handed down that then we have to pay for. That's always a challenge. And in, um, especially with, not only with um, the, civil unrest related to policing and uh, sheriff's office operations, but also the elections and how divisive that was. There are so many bills being introduced that are elections related or police related that are just kind of creating a lot of chaos and they're not going to be very productive. It's like a knee jerk reaction to something instead of a, a thoughtful dialogue about what 
if you're a legislature, the only thing you have is a law. So that they think the law is a law or a bill is the answer to everything, and it's really not. So that's always the biggest challenge for us when the legislature is in session and, and we don't know, you know, you have to fight a lot of bad bills and um, try to preserve what's good and what authorities you do have to make a difference to our local communities. Yeah, thank you. I'd love to get Serena's impression about that election comment. <laughs> <laughs> Serena, I you. agree. <laughs> I'll just say I Serena. agree with Susan. <laughs> Serena, what's been the big, what do you consider to be the biggest challenge for your organization? Yeah, I think the biggest challenge uh, is, is yet to come. And we're, we're living in it, obviously, and during the pandemic, but also just understanding the full effects of COVID on city revenues, frankly, and city businesses. Um, we've had a, a number of businesses that have closed during the, the pandemic. And I expect that there will be many that will be unable to return. So I think that we will not know the full economic effects of COVID for another year or so. Thank you, that's a that's an important point to bring on and that's relevant everywhere. Uh, Michael, how about you? You know, when I think about my department uh, specifically, uh, the one thing about communications and engagement is that uh, there's there's never enough to communicate. We, we can just be communicating and engaging uh, around the clock. And so by extension of that, I'm always really mindful of the, the health and well-being of my team and conscious of, of staff burnout. You know, when when you have uh, alternative uh, work arrangements, when you're, you have the ability to to work uh, from home and I've, I've been working from home since March of last year. Uh, you, you certainly just wake up and if it's 5 a.m. then you, you just start working on emails and that just rolls into the day and rolls into the evening. Um, you know, I, I certainly certainly love my job and I'm, I'm so grateful uh, to be overworked at a time at a time like this. But you know, always top of mind is, is the health and well-being of the team, not just in my department, but of course across the board in the corporation. Yeah, and uh, you know, as we kind of all shift back into the new normal, um, that organizational concern and just your abilities to adapt to a, to a new normal, I think is gonna be uh, an interesting thing to see just how it evolves. Um, your perspectives have been great today. I really thank all of you for your thoughts. You know, just thinking about the different ways that you're adapting to the challenges that you're confronting, um, the transparency, the accountability, the daily outreach, uh, those messages that are being sent out on a regular basis, I think it's just a really critical aspect and um, uh, of, of helping people stay connected to the community. I think all of you recognize the value of technology and it's a new way and will continue to be a very effective way for connecting with residents on things that you have going on, especially as we're continuing to work in a, in a virtual environment and, um, and then going forward maybe in a, in a hybrid environment. Um, one of the overarching messages that I am taking from the message today is just um, the focus commitment that all of you have expressed on dealing with the issues that are in front of you and uh, that community organizations and the employees have all come together to deal with uh, the challenges that have been confronted, but also recognizing the value and the importance of knowing what resident needs are, especially now when everything is so disrupted on the things that uh, the things that drive your community. Michael, your, your comments on the strategic plan and your organizational approach to incorporating and recognizing that centralized messaging, I think is a really solid point on um, tracking your performance over time because as, P as communities come out of COVID, I think being able to demonstrate your performance and being able to demonstrate the direction that you're taking <clears throat> is gonna be a much more important thing. So um, all of your comments are gonna be just wonderful things for other local government leaders to hear and just really thank you for um, the comments and the, the time you spent today. Um, I'm gonna follow this session up with uh, an email that'll give you the information from um, introducing you to each other. And so you've got contact information. You know, we do these panels every Thursday. And so if you have someone that you think would be good, at this discussion and would enjoy it, I would welcome you to get them connected with me so that we can continue to um, share these messages going forward. Next week, we actually are going to be hearing from uh, Enduro, Kansas, DeSoto, North Carolina, and Truro, Massachusetts. 
Uh, Michael, I really appreciate uh, you bringing a little bit of an international perspective to the table today, even though you're just across the border. Um, it just becomes really helpful to hear a global perspective and we need to hear more on a global scale on, uh, on the way that communities engage. Uh, you'll see in about three or four days, these uh, links on uh, LinkedIn, you'll get tagged. And so you'll start to see these and we want you to share those out so that people that respect your opinions and trust your ideas uh, can benefit from your perspectives. And I'll follow up. I'd love to get some feedback from each of you on how we can make these panels more effective, how I can do a better job. Um, anything that you think as local leaders, uh, your perspective is really valuable to me just so that I can improve these sessions as we go forward. Uh, but really just thank you for spending the time today and um, uh, sharing your thoughts and, and really benefiting other local governments through those ideas and, uh, and uh, creative solutions. Um, thanks so much for joining and uh, I'll look forward to keeping connected with you in the future.